challenged leader to this career happy hour. Welcome, everyone. It's Friday, 3 o'clock Pacific time. Sorry for being a couple minutes late. We are joined today by each other. This is a community, and it's called Career Happy Hour because we have an opportunity to greet each other, to share information, advice, and connection to people. If you don't know me, I'm Andrew Beach. I'm a teacher of self-education. I help professionals communicate their value in a way that isn't sleazy or how would you say it? arrogant, and then use that as a process by which to then network and find opportunities based on a plan. And that plan is one of your own creation. It's called the career map. And that's kind of the topic that I was thinking about today. You know, it's been a while since we've done like a book club, and I thought it might be a good idea for us to do a book club on, on this book, um, Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. And so if you haven't read this book, it's probably top five top 10, maybe networking books that are out there. And so if that's something uh, you haven't read yet, maybe we'll just start reading through this. It is literally 300 pages of content. So we do probably 30 pages over 10 weeks, 300 pages. That works, right? Should take us right into December, maybe even January. So if that if that's something you're interested in, we could start that today. If you have questions, of course, I'm here to answer your questions. So when you have an opportunity, place your um, place your questions in the uh, the chat box or the uh, comments down below. Either way, I track these comments and I can answer if you have questions. So that said, I would also encourage you to put your LinkedIn profile in the chat. Looks like my green screen is doing funny things, or maybe it's this. Uh, it, it might be. A restream that's doing crazy things. So I apologize for that. I might have to uh, disable my camera for a moment and just go with uh, the non virtual camera process here. So my apologies if you see me go away and then and then uh, come back uh, because that's just, uh, I suppose, uh, the way this is going to work. Let's see. Let's make sure this works. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Now you might see behind me a green screen, and so um, I've been having some issues with the uh, the camera, and you can see it's changing uh, off and on. And so maybe uh, maybe I need to make some adjustments here. Bear with me one moment, please, as I as I fix what's happening happening to us here today. Maybe get a little brighter. There we go. Hopefully that's that's a little better for you all. Uh, oh, that's a little too much, isn't it? That's a little too much. There, that's that's pretty good. And so it looks like the camera is creating some issues for us. Um, hopefully, that's not too too terrible for you to see or to um, to deal with. Uh, might be good for us to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So let me know where you're joining from. What questions do you have? And and I'll I'll try to work on these uh, technical issues as we. Uh, as we move on. And so you can reach me on LinkedIn. It's very easy to find me there. Um, my um, On the screen, you'll see my LinkedIn profile address. That's probably the best place, whether you're on YouTube or um, Twitter or some of the other channels we're on, like Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn is kind of where I hang out. So if you have any questions, comments, or want to, uh, in some way, uh, get more clarity on what we're talking about here, that it's totally fine by me. Um, and so I do indeed apologize for the uh, for the challenges that we've had uh, just getting uh, on today. So um, that said, maybe you should just dive into this book and and we can use that as an extension of the other book club um, thing that I did on the networking book. And I've got that up on the shelf. It's by Douglas B. Richardson. If you need to look that up, uh, that's great. Good to see you, Terry. Of course, always good to have you in the uh, in, in the peanut gallery. So I'm, I'm just going to dive into this book by um, Harvey, Harvey Mackey, M-A-C-K-A-Y. And maybe we could go through this together and kind of uh, think through some of the things that, that we can apply in our networking lives to make it a little bit better. I'm going to skip over acknowledgments and introduction and just dive into chapter one, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, and so chapter one is a network never sleeps. Our foursome 
that's golf for those who don't know, had finished the usual Saturday morning round of golf. We were in the clubhouse doing the post-mortem when Jerry said, last night I got a call. It was two in the morning. I won't tell you who it was because one of you might know him. He was semi-hysterical. His accountant had called him that afternoon and told him he was broke. His company couldn't make the payroll, and if he didn't receive the checks he'd written, there was a good chance he'd go to jail. The guy needed $20,000. The strange thing is, I hadn't talked to him in over 10 years. 10 years. Could you imagine someone coming to you after 10 years with that kind of an ask? He said that the only reason he called me was that I used to be a close friend and that I knew he was a trustworthy guy. Well, I offered to lend him a few thousand dollars, but I didn't give him what he needed, even though I could have. Isn't that interesting? It got me thinking, though, Jerry added, what if it had been me? How many people could I realistically count on to bust a gut to help me out if I'd called them at 2 a.m.? How many, Jerry? Two, maybe three. We ran around the table. The answers were about the same until they got to me, which is Harvey Mackey, of course. 50, I said. Come on, Harvey. That's BS. <laughs> no, it isn't. I said, I've been ready to make this kind of call that Jerry got for nearly 40 years. I never had to make it. I made 50 others like it instead. I've made 2 a.m. calls to find the absolutely best doctor in town in a family medical crisis. I made them to get a valued employee out of a blackmail situation and to stop a customer not only from dumping me, but to keep him from bad-mouthing me so totally, uh, so totally that my business would be ruined forever. I know I've been to the wall at least 50 times. And at, at each of one of these 50 times, I was able to find the right person to get me the help I needed. Ever since I was dumb enough to buy a bankrupt envelope company when I was just a kid, I've been building a network of people who I could count on and who could count on me in case one of those two AMers came around. I know I wouldn't have survived if I hadn't, and I'm proud that a lot of other people who made those kind of calls to me wouldn't have made it either if I hadn't been part of their networks. I feel so sorry for the guy called Jerry because it didn't have to come down that way. Isn't that true? What, but the guy didn't stay in touch. He didn't prepare. He not only didn't dig his well before he got thirsty, he waited until he was dying of thirst before he even started clawing the ground. Isn't that so true? So how many of us, and I think I come from a career coach perspective and many of the people I know and that attend these, these live sessions, um, maybe we're in career transition at some point. And so when you were working and you had somebody in career transition reach out to you that you haven't talked to in six years, 10 years, however long, and they asked you to help them find a job, how would you respond? I mean, it's very similar to that 2 a.m. call for the, the $20,000. I may give you something, but I won't give you what you're asking for. So that's something to think about. Um, let's see, how many names do you think he called before he called Jerry? A guy he hadn't talked to in 10 years, five, maybe 10, probably even more. And with each call, the odds grew longer against connecting because he was getting farther and farther away from his real network. Remember the Broadway show and movie Six Degrees of Separation? The title refers to the fact that there's a chain of no more than six people that links every person on this planet to every other person. What if I want to meet the president of GE and sell him some envelopes? That's Harvey Mackey's business, by the way. Um, and so what if I want to meet the president of GE and sell him envelopes? Well, I know somebody who knows somebody and so on, six deep. I can be standing there in Jack Welch's office pitching number 10s before we play our next round. That's a hell of a network, and we're all capable of developing one just like that. Now, some of us think this is a big, complicated thing. So don't worry. We're going to go through his little steps here that he suggests. And you can always, of course, look at my other video on networking. Um, there's a, I think there's a playlist. I might uh, uh, link it in here at some point. There is a playlist that you can access that has all of those, 
those sessions on it. But try to reach over five people between you and Welch directly, can't be done. What's Jerry's non-pals way? A non-network, a rope of sand? If you dig your well and actually have a network, you're going, you're never going to be out on that sixth dimension all by your lonesome, where all you get is busy signals and wrong numbers. Been there before, been on the outside looking in, not able to connect with somebody you want to connect with. Things go silent. Some people call it ghosting. Jerry, I just want you to know that if I get a late nighter from you someday, the 20 grand will be in your account within 24 hours. By the way, what have you got for collateral? What have I got for collateral? I remember catching one of those two AMers from you, Harvey. I've been there for you. <laughs> You're right, I said. And that's all the collateral you need. Jerry and I have been around forever. If we can keep our network going year after year, it isn't too late for you. The New England Journal of Medicine has published studies showing that people who stop smoking, even though they have smoked for decades, can cut their risk of lung cancer nearly to the same levels as people who have never smoked. Same reasoning with networking. The Mackey Journal of Networking has no published studies, but cheerfully predicts that no matter when you start, you can build a network of people who will pick up the phone ready to help if you ever had to make a call at 2 a.m. Mackey's Maxim. He has these little Maxims, so they're in a shaded box in the book, and it says 2 a.m. is a lousy time to try to make new friends. And so that's true. I mean, so 2 a.m. is, is a... Um, a metaphor, I suppose, for out of work or looking for work or finding a better solution for your career. So instead of saying 2 a.m., say, if you need a better solution in your career, it's not at that point that you would start digging your well. Um, you would dig your well before you're actually thirsty or need that that opportunity. So uh, good advice here so far. I don't uh, disagree with anything that he says. I think sometimes um, his approach is a little tongue in cheek. And so you have to separate sometimes the uh, um, the message from the delivery. Uh, and so that's certainly helpful. So um, chapter two, these chapters are pretty short. So if you do get this book, it's uh, Harvey Mackey, Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. If you're just joining us, it says the only networking book you'll ever need. I don't agree with that. There's plenty of networking books that you can use. I think the idea is to find a book or a way to uh, implement networking that that really works for you. So chapter two, six conclusions to begin. Knock, knock. Who's there? Not you anymore. <laughs> Dilbert. That's great. That's a Dilbert cartoon. Anyway, a few months ago, the New York Times ran a series of front page articles on the devastating effects of downsizing on American workers. Buried deep in the first article of the series was this paragraph, quote, as an officer in charge of operations for the Standard Chartered Bank, Mr. Allen had to dispose of one of three currency traders in the Toronto branch. The consensus choice happened to be a woman who was in indisputably the top performer, but had the weak weakest political bonds. Quote, I knew she was the best in the department, he said, but she had not networked. And I had to inform her that she was terminated. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and said, but Charlie, you know better. I will never forget what she said and how she looked that day. That's the end of the, the quote. Charles Allen, the man who fired the woman, is still haunted by the memory of it. I think that's something that we miss. when there, Whenever there's uh, layoffs, and there's a lot of layoffs going on right now, and, you know, when we're talking 2022, uh, I've seen ebbs and flows in, network, you know, in these kind of labor markets. So uh, it's not something that's going to go away. And, and so the, the layoffs or the terminations or the ebb and flow of business and economics is certainly going to impact each one of us in, in some kind of way. Charles Allen, the man who fired that woman, is still haunted by the memory of it. It is a mark on my character. I feel a lesser person. Uh, and, and some of us suffer that survivor's guilt, don't we? Um, we don't ever want to be the bearer of bad news. Alan is a fine, decent person, the kind of person who thinks about the consequences of his actions. He attends religious services every day. He has plenty of time for it. He lost his own job recently. <laughs> uh, karma. Uh, some people might call that karma or uh, Murphy's Law, I suppose. The articles ran for an entire week. They did not make pleasant reading. 
Since 1979, more than 43 million jobs have been lost in America. Though a greater number than that have been added, many are at lower pay. Among those people who have been laid off and have found new jobs, two-thirds are earning less. When I finished reading the articles, I came to these conclusions. Number one, talent alone is not, will not save you in today's economy. Good point. Two, the traditional advice, more training and education, will not save you. Three, the government will not save you. Four, no matter how self-reliant, dedicated, loyal, competent, well-educated, and well-trained you are, you need more than you to save you. You need more than you to save you. Number five, you need a network. You need your network. Every day, a network will help you deal with some of life's minor annoyances, as well as your most challenging problems. Your network can provide role models, advise you, comfort you, provide you with financial assistance, intellectual and social resources, entertainment, and a ride to work in the morning. Without it, you'll have a hard time finding a client, making a sale, seeking a job, hiring the right employee to say anything of the personal stuff like locating a competent doctor, buying a house, or deciding on a nursery school for your kids. If I had to name the single characteristic shared by all the truly successful people I've met over a lifetime, I'd say it is the ability to create and nurture a network of contacts. Number six, I would share that I had what I had learned from a lifetime of networking. No matter how smart you are, no matter how talented, you can't do it alone. That's the Mackey's maxim on that chapter. So that's chapter two. Look at that. I mean, that was like six pages. We're going, we're going right through these things. So if, of course, if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the comments. I'm happy to answer. We're reading through a book. We're doing a book club uh, action here so someone can come back and, and um, have an audiobook version of, of this at some point. So we're reading through uh, Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty, Chapter 3. Maybe networking really is rocket science. As is true of many sales types, I am a refugee from science in all its myriad forms. Someone once explained to me how the laws of aerodynamics make it possible for an 870,000 pound airplane with 400 passengers to lift off and fly across the Atlantic. I still suspect the real reason is that God holds it in the palm of his hand. I never imagined there was such a thing as a scientific study that proved the value of networking. I never imagined it because I couldn't imagine it. However, there is one. In the Harvard Business Review, Robert Kelly and Judith Kaplan wrote about a study they conducted of Bell Lab engineers to determine what attributes separated the 15 to 20 percent whom their peer group nominated as stars, nominated by their peers, from the average performers. Daniel Goldman reported the results in his popular book, Emotional Intelligence. Quote, one of the most important turned out to be a rapport with a network of key people, rapport. Things go more smoothly for the standouts because they put time into cultivating good relationships with people whose services might be needed in a crunch as part of an instant ad hoc team to solve a problem or handle a crisis, unquote. Why does it matter that stars in science network well? After all, scientific superstars are supposed to be loner nerds in white coats who wear coaster-sized glasses. It matters because superior technical networkers are the ones who, um, one, know where the grants and the research money are available, know who controls the purse strings so that they can get a fistful of dough. Two, dial up the best people in their specialty to get an answer when they are stuck with a problem. Three, know how to get their patents and discoveries celebrated in the press to help them to become rich and famous. And four, they are most likely to be confided in by their peers and are therefore likeliest to become hubs in their disciplines. Hey, so it takes me 300 pages to say the same thing. Ain't science grand. All together now, finish this sentence. It isn't what you know, it's who you know. Mackey's maxim, networking may not be rocket science, but studies prove it works for rocket scientists. Nice. Chapter four, short chapters. That one was only two pages. Harvey's top 10 list of the most important things a network can do. 
it's not enough for me to convince you that you need a network. I want you to know why. Here are 10 reasons why you need a network. Number one, a network replaces the weakness of the individual with the strength of the group. Groups. The one that seems to be doing the best is the WASP Millionaires Club. Luckily for those of us not in that one, there are a gazillion others we can join. The idea is to benefit members who have the same race, religion, gender, preference, ethnic background, business trade, and professional interest, economic interest, personal interest, you name it. We all belong to some of these groups and probably should belong to more. They're the basic building blocks of any networking system. If I had written this book five years ago, I would have suggested that people wanting to connect with a particular kind of group could find what they were looking for at only one place, the library. But now you have the option, the library or the internet. You can be online instantly communicating with people in whatever network you're interested in. Pause right there. Uh, LinkedIn is a perfect example of this, but it's not the only example. There's plenty of social networks out there that you can initiate contact with people that might have similar interests to you. Uh, Facebook groups is a good spot. Uh, connecting directly with people on LinkedIn is a good spot. I've even seen networks built on TikTok. So, it, you know, there isn't, um, there isn't any one place you should go. There is uh, a place that you probably feel most comfortable and accepted or, or, you know, in some way you feel like that's where your people are. And, and that's maybe where you want to invest some time and then pick a secondary, uh, have a primary and a secondary. Um, let's see. The benefits of this kind of network have been hyped so much already. The only thing left is to sound a cautionary note. Groups, be they the old fashioned meet for lunch every Wednesday types or the internet variety, are ready made for the group, not custom made for you. Like ready made suits, they're not tailored to fit your individually but to fit some basic group prototype. If you're looking for a scholarly analysis of 19th century Guatemalan postmarks or a rent-a-car discount, there's a ready-made group for you. If you're looking for the best urologist in town or trying to find out whether your department is going to get axed in the next downsizing, you need your own personal custom-made group. Not to say that you couldn't meet the girl or boy of your dreams at the next gathering of the International Society of Guatemalan Stamp Collectors. It's just that it wasn't designed to serve that purpose. But while you probably could find out whatever information you needed if you worked at it long and hard enough, why reinvent the wheel? Join the group that makes, uh, join the group that has the experts you need. Two, mirror, mirror on the wall. A network is the magic mirror that you can show you, you that can show you how the dress really looks on you before you wear it to the party. Does the big report you've been sweating over the last two months make sense? People who write or sell for a living, whether it's called marketing, marketing planning, or copywriting, or just plain peddling, need to know if their stuff works. Who is going to tell you before you go out and make an ass of yourself? Your network. Get a network going to read your copy or listen to your presentation, in return for which, of course, you do the same for them. Your network can identify what's unclear and confusing or simply wrong. They'll catch the typos and grammatical errors you never dreamed you made. They'll tell you what's funny, what isn't, what's perceptive, what's offensive. And that's where I think many people think that uh, when you reach out to your network, you should be sharing your, your resume with them or um, your LinkedIn profile or you know something of that nature and have them make sense of it for you. Uh, and I don't think that's the purpose of sharing that that kind of document with them is to get their perspective or maybe see if, if you've made mistakes. And so if you do present your resume or some content like that to your network, just make sure that your ask isn't for something too big other than, you know, proofreading. Don't think you need the kind of network. That kind of network never did Stephen Chow. In 1992, Chow was a whiz kid at Rupert Murdoch's Fox Network as Mortimer Feinberg and John Tarrant wrote in Why Smart People Do Dumb Things, he was a future, featured speaker at a management conference attended by Murdoch, the neoconservative guru Irving Kristol, uh, Defense Secretary Richard Cheney, National Endowment for the Arts Secretary Lynn Cheney, and others of that lofty ilk. Chow decided to loosen up things a bit. He hired a male stripper 
to skinny down and shake his booty right next to Ms. Cheney. Within hours, it was chow chow, meaning goodbye chow. Do you think Chow might have realized this little joke wasn't quite so funny as he thought it was if he'd had held his undress rehearsal first? <laughs> Even if you're not planning to hire the Chippendales to do their thing at your next pitch, you still can use your network for batting practice. It's such a good point. I mean, batting practice. So if I if I make myself available, I think that's the other side of networking. I make myself available to be that person, then people will actually use me for that purpose and then I'm paying it forward. I'm digging the well by being available to act as that person. Asking for a raise, interviewing for a job, presenting a report, whatever it is, your network can be your sounding board to learn what works and what doesn't. You'll avoid mistakes. You'll be helping others with the, the same needs as yours. Now let's go to the flip side. This time, instead of being on stage, you're in the audience. When you switch roles and become the critic, you're forced to analyze the performance. There's no better way to learn the tricks of the trade than by judging how others perform under conditions similar to yours. After all, the other members of your network are making a living doing the same thing you're doing. Most people have their own little ways. Learning how they do it will help you improve how you do it. Number three, know thine enemy through thy network. Okay, the Godfather movies, reinvented the gangster genre by adding a new element to the unusual rat-a-tat-tat -tat stuff. Business Administration 101. Michael Corleone doesn't say, I'm going to get them guys that got my brother. <laughs> Michael, our first movie business executive gangster, says straight out of Machiavelli, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Why should anyone do that? Because as everyone in business knows, you have to know what the competition is up to. Who will tip you off to a key employee maybe ready to jump ship to the competition? Who can you count on to help you counteract someone circulating negative gossip about your company? Who will tell you when others are making inquiries about you? In government circles, this is called intelligence gathering. We have great big agencies spending billions to spy on friends and enemies alike. In baseball, it's called stealing signs. There is always a place in the dugout for anyone who can pick off the other team's signs. The first week I went into sales, I spent the day with an old envelope dog following around a competitor's truck making envelope deliveries to customers. There's our prospect list, he told me. Another tactic some businesses use is hiring their competitors, disgruntled employees, or schmoozing with their suppliers, particularly if they've had happen to be their competitor suppliers and getting the buzz on what's going on across town. Is someone having trouble paying their bills? Is there a key employee who's looking to make a move? Are they having problems with any of their customers? Are they active in the community? Do they participate in fund drives and volunteer work? Do they have value education? Do they encourage their employees to improve their skills? How are they regarded in the industry? Do they attend trade shows? Are they involved in industry organizations? You don't want to be the last to know. There is no formal network for getting this kind of information. It can can come from anywhere. The one given, the uh, one fact that never changes is people love to talk. It's always smart to ha have some pipeline, however informal, into the enemy camp. Now, I would maybe question that. I'm, I mean, that certainly in sales, you may have that. But I think if you focus on your customer and, and provide good service, it's the same in networking. It's the same in job search. If you focus on the people you're trying to connect with or impress and uh, that sort of thing, then I wouldn't look at them as enemies. We're always going to have competition in, in the uh, talent marketplace. There's no doubt about that. But if I just focus on what I have to offer and making sure that I'm approaching the right people, uh, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time worrying about my competition. Suppliers, bankers, lawyers, customers, former customers, employees, former employees, salespeople, truck drivers, spouses, girlfriends, car dealers, bartenders at the Crosstown's factory's favorite watering hole. People love to talk. Keep your ears open. Information from your competitor's camp can come from anywhere, and it's pure, unalloyed gold. Now, I will agree with that. I think gathering information is part of networking. 
uh, I'm not so sure that you're looking for, uh, in this case, as a salesperson, you're not looking for some issue with your, your competition. What you're looking for is an opportunity. And an opportunity is uh, a place in which you can add value and you can bring something to the table in, in order to make an organization or a person's life easier. So keep your ears open. This applies whether you're talking about uh, corporations or individuals, businesses or personal relationships. You hate them so much you never want to have anything to do with them. No matter how you feel about the other guys, you could wind up doing business with them or at least gaining valuable information. Even the bitterest of enemies have been known to do it. I know when I was in sales, um, I never tried to burn a bridge or, or make uh, com competitors angry or, or diminish them in any way because I knew at some point I might be referring them business or they might be referring me business. So I, I always kept that, that, that window open. Number four, my network can help. My network can help you expand your network. Your network isn't like a stamp collection, something that sits in an album that you take out and look at from time to time. It's not fit. It's not for show. It's for go. One of the big mistakes you can make when you're starting your career is being afraid to use your network to ask for help. Now, we talked about that before on Career Happy Hour. Should you be asking for help? And I say, no, if, that, if you're not okay with that word, don't use help. Use um, insights, perspective, advice, right? You're asking somebody their opinion or their perspective. It's much different than saying, I need your help. Uh, I have no problem saying, I, I need your help. It's how you say it, I think. Sometimes you say, oh, you know, I need your help. Uh, and sometimes if you feel like you're diminished or in a bad way, where to start? There's dad, there's mom, but all their well-meaning career advice gets jumbled up with the other stuff about brushing your teeth and eating your broccoli. You need a fresh eye. Who's? Best bet, a family advisor, particularly a lawyer or a banker, a rich relative, one of your parents' bosses at work, anyone old, experienced in business with a wide range of contacts and some personal or professional connection to your family. Why? Because most so-called gurus and old fuds like me are downright flattered when someone asks their opinion on anything. That is so true. We have fewer axes to grind. It no longer seems like every kid who walks through the door is trying to take your job away or waste your time. Whether we formally inscribed it or not, we have a network and inevitably it's going to evaporate along with us and we know it. Still, we like, to, we like being a player and one way to do that is to pass along our time-honored war stories and offer a little godlike advice to whomever will listen. That's the perfect setup for a young person who needs help and knows how to ask for it. Make an appointment to see that old friend of dad's at his office or home if he's retired. Of course, you're not going to see him to ask for a job. That would be too crude and obvious. Good point. I like that. You want a little career advice. Believe me, you'll get it at length. And once you've gotten it, that old family retainer will have an investment in your future. Like the contributors to a political campaign, people who donate help to help you have a vested interest in seeing you succeed. Your failure would reflect on them, on the quality of their advice and on their continued relevance. Their network may be a little rusty, but it's probably going to be pretty powerful too. A lot of young people have gone a long way by getting themselves adopted by an old tiger. The cub gets the benefit of the tiger's teaching. The tiger gets a disciple. Here are some examples. Tiger, Saul, cub, David. Tiger, Julius Caesar. Cub, Mark Anthony. Tiger, big Jim Colis Colosimo. Colisimo. Uh, cub, Al Capone. Tiger, Betty Davis. Cub, Ann Baxter. Uh, Henry Ford, Lee Iacocca, and so on. But tigers and tigresses, beware. Cubs grow up and sprout claws. As you may have noted, not many of these cubs were content to remain in the shadows of their mentors. Number five, a network can enrich your life anywhere in the world. How many non-Americans are there in your network? With phone rates, email, and faxes measured in pennies these days, it's hardly any more costly to build a global network than a local one. It's not tough to learn what about customs and holidays abroad. Most places where you can find a greeting card will also sell you a global calendar so you know when to send it. 
I'll start you off with a couple of freebies. In Holland, St. Nicholas Day, December 6th. In Hong Kong, Chinese New Year, always celebrated between January 21 and February 19. One of the most powerful global networks is Waxni, or Overseas Chinese. Um, there are 50 million people in this network, and they control huge wealth because the importance of that extended family has to Chinese business. In France, a huge percentage of the corporate bigwigs are graduate of Ecole Nationale d'Administration or the Polytechnique. In Israel and Switzerland, compulsory military service creates an important lifelong network. Members have to serve in the reserve until they're 55. In Japan, graduation from Tokyo University's law school is the prize credential for career politicians or high-ranking bureaucrats. In Poland, it's the Committee to Defend the Workers. Sounds like a classic communist cell, but actually the group has fought both the communists and the right-wingers. And then there's the wonderful old boy network in Russia, the communists. They're just itching to stop reminiscing or start giving each other high-buck government jobs again. Networking has always been crucial for immigrants. They use the strength of the group to gain an economic foothold to their new countries. If you live in an American city, you're bound to have noticed the number of self-help organizations that have sprung up among the growing Hmong, Laotian, Thai, Korean, and Vietnamese populations. I've traveled with my wife, Carol Ann, to over 70 countries, and there's no emptier feeling than being in a foreign country and not knowing a soul. There you are, alone, knowing you may never have the opportunity to be there again with no one, with no one to invite you into their home so you can see the, how the people actually live. If you've got a network here, you can have a network anywhere. For openers, all it takes is one simple question to the people in your network. Do you know, do you do much traveling? All people love to talk about their trips and they can literally open up the whole world for you. Also, there's always someone here doing business there. How do you find them? Your banker will know. Do you have a banker? Additionally, you can get that information about almost any public company in their annual reports. Good point. Public companies, annual reports, a great way to find out what's going on in an organization. Get those at the library or from your friendly stockbroker. Don't have to do that. Most of those are on investor relation tabs on any corporate website. Or try the nearest university. You'll find students and faculty with contacts everywhere in the world. If you're in school, the International Student Organization is a great place to start. Why should they bother you with you? Good question. Because you'll make them part of your network. You'll hand carry gifts, pictures, greetings, whatever their friends and relatives in, you know to pop in for dinner both here and abroad. Maybe there are better ways to say it, but they always give me the check anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's different languages. Anyway, six, a network can provide you with new experiences and knowledge. I know a fellow who manufactured waffle irons. He sold his company for more money than he ever thought possible and retired at the age of 50. By age 50 and three months, he was climbing the walls, had been a racing fan all his life, so he decided to go into the horse business. The first horse he bought never made it to the track. The second and third were a little better. They earned modest sums before they, too, broke down. The fourth horse was the charm. While he didn't actually make money on it, he entered it at several of the better tracks in the country where he won a few races and lasted for several seasons. Some people have pictures of their family on their walls, but he has pictures of himself with his horses. Horse owners are a unique subculture. Many couldn't tell a hawk from a stock. They compete with each other uh, for goals that are essentially meaningless. 90% lose money, and those who make money generally don't need it to begin with. But still, you have only to look at the beaming faces in those winner's circle pictures to realize that the satisfaction of owning a racehorse has nothing to do with anything that makes economic sense. It comes from being momentarily successful in a slightly glamorous, slightly naughty enterprise removed from the world or waffle irons. Quote, a good horse will take you places you never dreamed of, unquote, Mr. Waffle Iron told me. True enough. Thus, it is that even for those of us who stomp waffle irons while fantasizing of rubbing elbows with the willy shoemakers of the world, there are networks to match our dreams. Seven, networking help you can help you help others. Networking can be very rewarding for people who work this system on their own behalf. It can also be rewarding for people who work on it 
on the behalf of others. Many alumni are active in recruiting promising students to their alma maters because they want young people to share the experience they had years earlier. Others enjoy giving career advice and counseling. That's my bag. It's become my avocation. I've done this with over a, th a thousand young people in the course of my lifetime, and I get enormous satisfaction from hearing from them and about them as uh, their career progresses. But don't they ever need to buy envelopes? Question mark. Charitable and civic organizations are desperate for volunteers, especially fundraisers. The best fundraisers are people willing to call their friends and associates and ask them for money, particularly if those friends and associates are wealthy and beholden to the callers in some way. Not many people will do that kind of networking. They don't enjoy making those phone calls and in, any more than anyone likes being on the receiving end and having dinner interrupted with a pitch for money. If you are one of the rare types who are good at it, uh, you can benefit a lot of people who need help. You could also probably make a damn good living in sales. That is true. Sales and, and development for nonprofits is, is very synonymous. There's a creative way to combine your efforts on behalf of individuals with your fundraising duties. When I'm asked for a favor, I'll often tell the caller, quote, I'll be happy to make a best efforts attempt on your behalf on one condition. What do you think that might be? Uh-oh, what's that? If I deliver, then I want you to make a donation of X dollars to X charity. I fill in the blanks based on the difficulty of the task at hand and a kind of seat in the pants rotation among the United Way the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, and a few others. Occasionally, I'll have to haggle back and forth a bit, but no one has ever said no yet. How can they, when they're asking for a favor for themselves and I'm asking for help for their community? I can testify that when I'm holding the hammer like that, there have been more than a few audible quips on the other end of the line as they absorb the price tag for the favor, but no one has ever turned me down. Politicians describe giving personal help as constituent work. It involves acting as an ombudsman for people who don't have the clout to get their concerns dealt with satisfactorily, particularly when they involve a government bureaucracy. Veterans benefits, social security claims, admission to subsidized housing, recommendations to the service academies are all common areas of constituent service for members of Congress. One phone call from the right poll is sometimes all it takes to get matters taken care of. Doing these kinds of favors are the politicians' stock in trade. Know any polls? Many ordinary, ordinary people don't, but guess what? Most wealthy and powerful people do. They know them not because they are a charming company or because they need help battling the Medicare bureaucracy on behalf of grandma, but because polls do favors. Not only for the less fortunate, but for the more fortunate. Big favors. And the other... And like other all too human types, the more favors you do for the polls, the more likely the polls are to do favors for you. You don't necessarily have to make big campaign contributions until they abolish door to door canvassing, lawn signs and envelope stuffing. There will be politicians you need who need your help. Ask yourself this question. Do you think you might ever need theirs? If the answer is yes, then there's a network you might consider joining. Political campaigns seek volunteers just as eagerly as charities do. But when you work for a poll, the ethics of how you do things are a little different. Politics is a bare knuckle business. No one takes the Boy Scout oath. Doing political volunteer work can be very demanding and very time consuming and unlike community organizations will go on and on forever. When you work for a poll, you're a winner only if your candidate is. The side benefits of volunteering come under the heading of doing well by doing good. Volunteering for community organizations can put you in touch with the heavy hitters in town. New kid on the block? Poor but talented and, and ambitious? The people who make up the boards of these outfits tend to be your community's corporate leadership. Here's how you can get them to meet them and, how, and show them your stuff by making yourself and your skills known to them. By doing so, you're adding valuable contacts to your network. As for polls, they're generally regarded as excellent personal references when you're applying for a school or looking for a job. If they win, they may even be a job in it for you. Eight, job security. Don't rely on the corporation, rely on your network. 
About the same time the New York Times was doing its series on downsizing, Fortune magazine was analyzing the same situation from a different perspective. The Times reported what was happening. Fortune told its readers how to survive it. Stalin said, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Because 40,000 layoffs also is a statistic, Fortune used individual case histories to give a human dimension to the problem. The magazine described the impact of the massive layoffs at AT&T on five, uh, let's see, on five of the laid off employees and their families. Their prime example, a 43-year-old project manager named Paul Klemchok, was featured on the cover. Klemchok sin? He was a generalist. What the company needed was specialists. He had been given 60 days to find a new job within the company or be let go. As the clock was ticking, Kemchok described himself as scared senseless. By the time the article was written, he'd already applied for 50 jobs and been turned down for all of them. Why do you think that is? Because I think we've discussed on Career Happy Hour that activity is not high, high value, high return on investment, making just putting out uh, resumes. Fortune's take was that with companies depth bombing entire departments, it no longer made sense to rely on your boss to save you. He or she may be just as vulnerable as you are. So true. The key, networking. Cops who are uh, uh, always on the mercy of the political winds call it having a rabbi, a superior in another department who watches out for them in return for loyalty and information. I wonder if priests have rabbis. To benefit, you'll want to establish ties across the organization. How? Fortune suggests you try to become part of a cross-functional team, a network, so you can get to know folks in other departments. Well, that's fine as far as it goes, but what if there isn't any such teams in your company? I'd say establish your own. Your network can be formal or informal. That is, you can, one, dream up a company-approved team project that operates through standard company procedures that will put you into the close working relationship of people of other departments. Two, establish a buddy system, a back channel network of people who will watch out for possible slots in their area for which you may train or qualify in return for you doing the same for them. Three, do both. The AT&T announcement accounted for to formal recognition that people who had network, whether as members of company authorized cross department teams or simply as buddies, were the only ones who stood the chance of survival. Not surprisingly, one survivor turned out to be the cover boy, Paul Klemchok. Two days before he was set to be let go, he found a job within the company marketing phone equipment. Maybe he discovered a network he didn't know he had. Or maybe AT&T decided not to risk a follow-up article in Fortune magazine describing their despondent ex-employee aimlessly pacing the floor of his modest Cape Cod house in New Jersey. Don't rely on the system, says Fortune. Amen, says Envelope Man. That's Mackie. Number nine, a network can make you look good. No salesperson who knew the names of his customers' kids ever went broke. Knowing the spouse's name, unfortunately, is no guarantee. You haven't seen your old buddy, buddy in a couple of years. You call him for lunch. Here's how it goes. How have you been, buddy? Great. How's Badette? Bodette ran off with her psychiatrist. They're living in Anchorage. Oh, well, how's, tr how's that terrific dog of yours, Squat? Squat died. I have a new dog now, Grunt. Oh, not pretty, right? I know. It's happened to me, too. A name and a few scribbled notes on a three-by-five card do not constitute a network. You have to keep it fine-tuned or you're going to run into a lot of buddy-type situations. Two years is too long between tune-ups. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You just maybe should approach it differently than asking how is so-and-so or, or how's the dog or how's the wife or that sort of thing. You might want to start by apologizing. Uh, the change your oil every 3,000 miles, don't you? That's about once every three months. So that's a good call. Four times a year. Um, not too difficult. I, I think in real estate, they had a thing, a seven-touch system seven touches over, over the year on a birthday, an anniversary, a home anniversary, you know, been in your home six years kind of thing. Your car just gets you to work. Your network can determine whether or not you've got work to get to. To keep your network up and running, freshen up each entry at least once every six months. 
if you aren't actually sure whether Buddy and the last known Mrs. Buddy are still buddies, don't ask unless Buddy asks you about your spouse or mentions his. That's the best indicator that you're in a safe territory. Start off by talking about his kids. That gives him the chance to slip in any information he wants you to know. 10, because we talked about 10 things. This is actually a longer chapter, isn't it? Uh, 10, a network expands your financial re reach indefinitely. So far, we've talked about networking among individuals. Barter, sophisticated modern barter, is networking among corporations. What makes it different from personal networking is that barter is networking stripped down to the bare essentials, cold-blooded, tit-for-tat exchanges. No idle chit-chat, no Christmas cards, no didn't we meet at the coin collectors, hoedown, just business. For five years, I served on the board of Atward Richards at the world's largest barter company. Barter? Every, everyone knows what barter is. That's caveman sitting around the fire chewing the fat, literally, until one guy offers another guy a swap. Like a bear hide for a spear and a cup of couple of fish hooks, right? Wrong. Barter is practiced today by corporations in light years, is light years away from a simple Stone Age two-way exchange of goods. And it's probably the smartest, most effective form of corporate networking there is. Though corporate barter can consist of bilateral trade, in the real world, such transactions are rare. It's unlikely to find two companies with simultaneous equal and opposite needs. Let's say you run a United States-based chemical producer doing business in Africa. We'll call it the Chemco Company. You've agreed to take locally made sheets and pillowcases as well as a certain amount of production time at a weaving mill to satisfy your obligation. You have no use for 100,000 sheets and pillowcases, nor for the production time, nor do you have a clue as to how to market them. Enter the barter company. They happen to handle several hotel chains for clients interested in bartering. Hotel company A winds up with Chemco sheets and pillowcases. Hotel company B wants towels and they want them with their monogram on them. Hotel B company winds up with the production time at the mill where towels are made according to B's specs. Chemco winds up with the room, food, and beverage trade credits for its sales force to use at hotels. What are some of the other benefits of becoming part of the barter network? Your existing channels of distribution are not distributed. In fact, you may wind up with a whole new channel of distribution or a new marketplace. You will quickly reduce costly warehousing and carrying charges since you will be using your inactive products as payment for things you are now paying for. You will A, increase your cash flow, B, reduce your cash outlay. What can you use for barter? Excess inventory, underutilized production time, canceled projects, leaving you with equipment you can't use, counter trade obligations as a result of having to accept payment in goods rather than cash, typically when dealing with foreign companies. What kind of companies are doing this? How about Caterpillar, Amico, Pfizer, JCPenney, Goodyear, USX, um, Exxon, Bell South, Monsanto? The list of companies engaged in bartering reads like the who's who of the Fortune 500. When Peter Uberoth headed the U.S. Olympic Committee in 1984, he put barter at the heart of his promotional efforts. He swapped the Olympic logo for airline transportation for use of 500 Buicks for 250,000 feet of Fuji film plus processing for Levi Strauss and Converse clothes and shoes. According to sales and marketing management, he even traded the logo for a swimming pool to be built by McDonald's. Both financially and operationally, the 84 Olympics were the best in the history of the games. I was in the audience when Uberoth was introduced. It was the only time in the history of sports when 100,000 people gave a standing ovation to the guy who sold them the tickets. Time is perhaps the easiest commodity to barter. Radio stations are notorious barterers, forever trading out commercial time for whatever it is their advertisers are peddling. Sometimes it's airline space. What a perfect swap. The radio station barters unsold time for an unsold airline seat. Neither party is out a dime. Both parties benefit. Corporations understand that barter is a form of networking that you can get what you want uh, for what you don't need. And that's as close to something for nothing as you're ever going to find in this life. Convinced? If not, keep reading. Knowing what a network is and is not will tell you what it can and can't do for you. Mackey's Maxim. If you're not convinced you need a network after reading this chapter, go back and read it again. 
it, it was a pretty heavy chapter. So that was chapter, which chapter was that? Let me make sure I have this correct. That was a lot of pages. Chapter four. Yeah, that was a, a solid 16 pages. And we, we filled an hour. So sorry about that. Um, good to see everybody. I mean, that's, if you're, if you want to keep doing this, great, we'll do it. If you don't, let me know that too in the comments. Uh, I don't mind reading through this book and, and getting it uh, recorded and having conversations about it. So um, I hope you have a great weekend. Um, and we'll see you next Friday for Career Happy Hour, where we continue to read Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you next week.